10 second security tip go you can never be too organized oftentimes think you know what you're defending and sometimes you don't so pay attention to the details and get organized it's time to begin the CISO security vendor relationship podcast Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. My co-host, as always, joining me is Mike Johnson. We are sponsored today by Expel. And actually, our guest comes from Expel. You'll hear from him in just a moment. Just a quick announcement I want to make is we've got a webinar coming up this Friday. That would be September 20th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. It is going to be a roundtable video discussion on the topic of... Are cybersecurity sales incentives helping or hurting the industry? While I have a couple of panelists to discuss this, anyone with a microphone and a webcam can join in on the discussion. So head over to CISOseries.com and register for the event. I would like to bring in our guests for today. He comes from Expel. He's our sponsor guest. And so we have to thank Expel for sponsoring this episode and bringing this really stellar guest to us, and you're going to find out why as we go on with the show. It is Bruce Potter, the CISO of Expel. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We've got listeners, and they've got questions. A listener who wishes to remain anonymous asks, I am a one-person security organization, and I get frustrated reading industry news and even listening to the CISO series love the show. My frustration is that so very often articles, blogs, and podcasts assume that you, your organization has a security team. How do you thrive and not just survive as a security shop of one? Now, we could obviously do an entire series on this, but let's isolate it to this one question. And I'm going to ask you first, Mike, what can a one-person shop expect to do and not do? First of all, anonymous listener, thank you for asking this question. I think one of the things to keep in mind is so many of these articles, podcasts, everyone who's out there talking, they're talking more aspirational. A lot of shops really are in the same boat as you. You're, you're not alone. There's a lot of places where they're making, they're making do with one person or frankly, maybe even less than one person. So the fact that your organization at least has one person who that's their responsibility. I know it feels like a lot, but you're ahead of a lot of places. But that said, thinking about how you can really amplify yourself comes down to, you know, how do you democratize security? How do you spread it throughout the organization? How do you influence others? How do you find allies so they can do work on your behalf? There's only so many hours in the day that you're going to be able to get things done. So you really need to bring in others to help. You can think about consultants, think about services, and really a lot of it comes down to you being the architect for security, thinking about the bigger picture of how you can apply your knowledge, how you can find those multipliers and spread those ideas throughout the organization in ways that are actionable. A lot of it really is people are going to be looking to you for guidance on security. So be there for them, write some documents, write some position papers, have some internal presentations. Well, don't, don't you fear that, you know, being a security shop and not one and nobody else kind of quote cares about cybersecurity? Again, I'm being sort of negative on this purposely because I think that's how it works. Is anyone, do you think, going to read these papers, these position papers on security? I think in some respects, we need to get out of the, this assumption that that everyone is down on security. Again, there are plenty of organizations that have no security staff. So that they have one or more, there actually is a desire for security in this organization. If they didn't care, they just wouldn't have this person at all. So I, I think that you know the first start is to assume good intention and make the material available for people when they ask. At some point, someone is going to ask if they're not already. And kind of the worst response is, 
oh, let me get back to you in a week while I go and write down my thoughts. If you've already got all of that written, when those questions come up, and inevitably they will, you'll have something ready to go. And then also if it's something that is sitting there available for other people to go find, sometimes they'll go look on their own and they'll find it. So I, I don't assume that this is a case of they don't care about security. That's not actually what the person said. I tend to be an optimist. And so I, I think if we, if this person makes these materials available, they will be useful. All right, Bruce, I'm going to ask you the same exact question. What can be expected of a, a one person shop? And I got to assume like, like a, a school district, would be this would be the case. If they're lucky, they get a single person that works in security. Yeah, I think school districts are a good example, as well as like uh, local governments, county governments, that kind of thing. I've seen that situation, too, where you get a person, maybe an FDE or at least a other duty as a sign of the security. And to amplify Mike, I, I've certainly talked to people in this space who who feel like they're alone and feel like this must be unique to them. The unfortunate reality is there's a lot of organizations in this in this position. And just because one person thinks, well, I don't know how to do these the components of their risk system, it turns out there's a whole bunch of us who are still figuring all this out, right? Everything from like how to do a risk assessment and vulnerability scan to how to communicate with your, your seniors and the executives in the organization. I mean, these are things we all struggle with. We're all kind of rowing in the same direction. So my first suggestion is like, don't be shy about talking to your peers. There's a, other people in these positions and we should all share tips and tricks. I think the biggest thing that you can do is recognize that you're a scarce resource. And so you need to be very organized, very prepared and really understand what the most bang for the buck for your organization that you can do. There will be tactical things that you have to do, responding to incidents, dealing with user questions, that kind of thing. I think that the best thing that, that I've done is use a framework like the NIST cybersecurity framework to rapidly assess yourself and your organization and see where you are and then try to figure out where do you want to go. We've actually on the uh, Expel.io website have a free Creative Commons uh, NIST cybersecurity self-assessment tool that we release. I've created it in the past when I was a consultant and used it with some of the largest financial institutions in the world as well as state and local governments and had a lot of success with this. It usually takes us two hours, maybe three to drive through the tool and get yourself an idea of where you are today and where you're trying to go. And very quickly with the CSF, regardless of the methodology, I found that you can find like where are those big gaps, where are the things that really matter to my business. And that means when you do have those rare moments of spare time, you know <laughs> where the best places you can invest your time and energy. So when you're army of one, those moments are few and far between. So you got to make the best use of them that you can. Let's dig a little deeper. Bruce, not only are you the CISO of Expel, but you are also the founder of the Schmoo Group and your wife, the organizer for the annual Schmoo Con, which is a hacker conference held in DC every year. I'm stunned that your 2200 person event sells out in less than 20 seconds. By the way, if I read that correctly, I saw one thing that said 10 seconds, other 20 seconds. Regardless, that's fast. There is obviously a huge demand to attend and speak at your event. This year's event, I saw that you said that you had 168 submitted talks and 41 were accepted. So about one in four. Myself, Mike, and our audience would be eager to hear your criteria on what makes a great ShmooCon submission and what are some of the most memorable talks from ShmooCon? What makes them so great? Sure. So for our conference, one of the things, that, I mean, the, the real founding principle of the conference was to hold speakers accountable and to try to get new information into the community. So it was actually a, another Shmoo member and I were at Black Hat one year and someone was on stage saying something that was functionally equivalent to one and one is three. And we said, well, that's just not true. And nobody said anything. And, and he said to me, he's like, man, if we ran our own conference, we wouldn't let that stand. We'd call that guy out. So yeah, we certainly would. Well, listen to, the, by the way, the last episode of this very podcast, we talked about this very issue where people were calling out a speaker on stage because they didn't believe him. It's a glorious thing when it happens. And, and <laughs> it's an industry where people can get on stage and, and really not have the knowledge or the, the background to be guiding people, but people believe them because they're up on stage. And why wouldn't you believe the person with the microphone? So, you know, he said, I remember he said, well, we should run our own conference. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And I thought it was kind of like <laughs> just Vegas humor. And then like two months later, he had reserved the Marriott in Washington, D.C. And we, <laughs> we had to move on one. 
a few months after that. But a big part of our philosophy is trying to hold the speakers accountable. We actually arm the audience with squishy foam rubber balls. And we encourage them to throw them at the speaker when they disagree. Oh, I didn't know this. So does that actually happen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's become kind of iconic. People actually bring their smooth balls to other conferences to bean speakers with. So can you give me an example of someone at a smooth con saying something that got pelted? You know, I, it's funny, like the, the specific examples tend to be more when someone says something outlandish, you know, Linux is the best operating system or something okay. like that. But there have been times when people make kind of bold claims about things that their tools can do or the research has shown and somebody will beat them and then be like, prove it. And they'll have to have to walk through and in greater detail. And and it's proven to be a good way to get people to to engage and to keep the speakers on their toes, especially because we tend to bias towards new and first time speakers and new content. You know, we get uh, each year between 20 and 30 percent of our speakers are first time speakers. So it's a pretty big venue for your first event. So, you know, they can be a little nervous. But on the flip side, they know that this is going to be an honest discussion. And I think that they actually enjoy the fact that the audience is going to participate with them in a, in a meaningful way to make their their work better, which I mean, these, in general, people that are presenting at these events are, they care, right? You're here in a weekend, right? You're spending your own time. This is your own investment. And to know that other people are willing to help you be, become better at your, your trade means a lot to the speakers and to the audience. So can, can you give me an idea, like what's in a speaker presentation goes, oh my God, we have to have this person speak. I mean, like this story is, I mean, like, is it just something new? It's got to be something more than that. What is it? We do not generally accept talks that are about attack unless it's a, a broad, like new spectrum type of attack kind of thing, more of a class discussion rather than specific vulnerabilities. Specific vulnerabilities aren't necessarily of interest to us. We get very excited when we see new defenses people using existing technology and creative ways to defend their networks and systems in ways that haven't been done before. I think in general, the focus on making your organization more secure rather than finding weaknesses in individual things are the types of topics that really, really get us engaged. Now, can you think of, before we close out this segment, and Mike, I know you, we've been just listening to Bruce here, but if you want to add anything, can you think of like one or two crazy memorable talks? What was it that made it so great? You know, I, I think some of our keynotes have been really interesting. We actually had a keynote. It was a guy from MIT talking about how they were doing basically automated builds inside of uh, shipping containers where they would use tools to build other tools. And then those tools would build other things. And eventually you could fabricate houses and stuff out of all these things that came out of this container. And so that was not like a cybersecurity talk, but it was a way to get the audience to think creatively about the tools that are in front of you, myself and a bunch of other kind of first gen schmoo were all from Alaska at the time. And we did not have a lot to deal with uh, very few computers, very little bandwidth, and we learned to make do with very little to do a lot. So that kind of message when we hear that, and the audience gets it like we did with that keynote in particular, it really tends to get people's attention. I've got a question that that I've been kind of curious about because I've I've tried to attend many a ShmooCon and have been uh, unable to get a ticket myself. You got to move fast. You got twenty yeah, seconds. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I evidently can't type fast enough. First of all, I, I like what you're saying about the focus on first time speakers and first time presenters, and and also I love the focus on on defensive topics. I'm I do not need another topic or or something on like you know here's the latest exploit or something or attack technique. There's way too much of that out there already. So I really appreciate that focus. Black hat. I'm curious though, why do you limit attendance to 2200? There's a couple of things at play. One, the, the space that we're in right now, the Washington Hilton works very well with that uh, number of people. Uh, DC has actually kind of had limited space between from 2000 to 5000. There's only a few places that can take kind of in between there. And then after that, you're at the Washington Convention Center and convention centers are just kind of a bummer when it mm -hmm. comes to conferences. The other thing is that this conference is our family business. My wife and I and my kids are all kind of take point on it. So uh, around Christmas time, which is usually just a few weeks before the con, our house isn't filled with presents, but rather all the swag for the con, equipment, computers, a bunch of crap, and shows up day after day after day from the UPS truck. Our garage is our fabrication center. We've got uh, laser cutter and vinyl printers, vinyl cutters. I mean, my kids spend most of their Christmas time like making badges and printing banners. So about 2,000 people is kind of the family limit. <laughs> we can't okay. really, can't put the throttle down anymore because I think we'd all kill each other. All right. Well, we want your family to stay in one cohesive unit. So I kind of reading into it, maybe putting a little bit of words in your in your mouth there. You don't want to get much bigger. 
No, we've been at this size now for, I think, seven or eight years, and we're pretty happy uh, with this. It. It's easy for us to manage, and it's still small enough that you get to meet a lot of people, but big enough that you get a diversity of, of backgrounds there, so you can meet new people and get new ideas. I mean, we're very happy with the size for a variety of reasons, really. It's time to play What's Worse? Do you know how this game is played, Bruce? The title is pretty much says it all. I think I can infer, yes. Yes. So what's going to happen is I'm going to provide two scenarios. I always make Mike answer first. Uh, the two scenarios are generally awful. You're not going to like either one, but it's a risk management game, and you have to determine which of the two is worse. And this one comes again from Eric Block, who, by the way, he sent me a flood of phenomenal what's worse scenarios. And two things. We have danced around this question a bunch of times. And I will also say this what's worse scenario probably rings true to the largest amount of our audience possible because I'm sure everyone's dealt with this before. So here we go. What's worse? Having budget to buy the security tools you need, but not having the staff to use or maintain them or the opposite, having the staff, but no budget for anything close to proper security tooling. All right, Mike, what's worse? <laughs> okay, okay, I might have to, with, with this one, I might have to call a, a moratorium on questions from Eric for a while. This one, this one's a tough one. <laughs> so, you know, really what you've got, and again, I think a lot of these questions boil down to the build versus buy, yes. in my mind, where you've got this budget that you can go out and buy the most amazing tools, services, whatever, you know, what else, whatever is out there but there's no way you can actually implement them. So you end up with shelfware. Or the the flip side, you really have no budget, but at the same time you have an amount of staff that you can kind of maybe cobble together what's out there available, you know, open source world. For me, I tend to always lean a little bit more towards the the build side. I'm I'm I guess an engineer at heart when it comes right down to it. So for me, this is almost an easy one when it comes right down to it because of that leaning. Well, you started saying it was too difficult. Now, well, I would say if you were a security shop of one, although you wouldn't have the staff, what am I saying? Right. But I know it, that when you were at Lyft, you were very much more of a build rather than buy type yes. shop. Yeah. And, but the, the reason why I, I say this is, this is a difficult one is you kind of have to think about the what's next. You know, if, if you're going and, and implementing a whole bunch of open source tools, you're now having to maintain them and, and you're kind of stuck with that. And so that has to be part of your decision making on this one. But because I've, I'm kind of used to that world, for me, it's a little bit easier that I, I, I'm going to lean towards the build side. So it's something that you have to think about and you have to sit down and, and think, do I really want to maintain all these things forever? And that's what makes it difficult is it's not just as simple as, oh, well, I'll just build it and, and that's fine. Because then when it breaks, you get to keep both parts. So for me, for this question, the worst one is I don't have any budget for people. I've got all the budget to buy things, but not enough for people. So all capital, no operational. Exactly. So that in, in my mind, for this question, that's the worst answer. All right. I will go to you now. Bruce, do you agree or disagree with Mike? And sometimes you can agree, but not for the same reasons. What do you say? Well, I agree. I think that pragmatically, I can have a bunch of people go build things, but I can't have a bunch of software go build things for me. We haven't quite reached that point of AI and robotics that I can <laughs> sick my firewalls on assembling a better firewall. So <laughs> I'd have to agree that, you know, the, 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 the people can at least uh, cobble together duct tape and bailing twine and, and make things kind of work. But I, I, you know, I also agree that we're at a point where some of these enterprises are becoming so complex that the one advantage of these products, even if you struggle with certain products in the past and, and you know, they, they've been kind of difficult to maintain or, or, or implement, you're really standing on the shoulder of many people when you purchase a kind of modern day software product or, or solution in the cybersecurity space. And, and if you ask you know, a group of people to take some open source tools and, and hammer them together, like, you know, trying to build fire from scratch, you know, you'll get something that works, but it will probably not be keeping pace with where you actually need to be if you were able to actually buy, you know, modern day products. But that said, at least humans can be resourceful and creative. So I'd much rather have the humans uh, than a bunch of robots in the data center who can't do anything. 
Hey, you're a CISO. What's your take on this? So an issue that comes up in security all the time is how do you do more with less? So I'm going to start with you, Bruce, on this. And this, I know, is this is a really open-ended question. And heck, we could do an entire show on this. But let's just start at the top and like, you know, best bang for your buck in terms of dollar in slash time. Are there ways to advance your security program when you don't really have any more budget or more people to do so? Where do you begin? So I think that the great place to begin is, is living creatively off the things that you already have, right? So in 2016, I had the pleasure of serving as a technical advisor to the Obama's Commission on Cybersecurity and travel around the country talking to companies who, you know, are all kinds of shapes and sizes from a cybersecurity perspective to learn what works and what doesn't work for them. And what I found kind of uniformly with a whole bunch of companies that invested in a lot of technology and still hadn't quite found the thing to that enabled them to really have the visibility to have the operational view of their organization that that they wanted. And it seemed like, you know, they were kind of hoping the tool would just do the thing that they hoped the tool would do and the tool didn't. So they kind of put their hands in the air and be like, this thing's terrible. In reality, there were creative uses of existing tools that solve extra problems. And sometimes you don't realize that you have the tool in front of you. So as an example, my favorite thing is the, the CIS security controls. The first control is uh, asset management, where you have to have like a complete and totally up to date asset list of everything in your organization, and which is just kind of fantasy for 99.99% of people. And if you read that, you think, wow, I would need to go buy yet another tool and go buy an asset management platform. It's just more money that you don't have. The reality is you probably have DHCP logs, you have vulnerability scans, you have web logs, you have a whole bunch of artifacts that you already kind of know what's on your network and who's connecting. And if you want to know like who all your mobile users are, look at the web logs for your mail server. You'll find all everybody's cell phones and everybody's iPads and tablets and things of that nature. So the, the data exists in your organization for things like asset management on the software and hardware side and doesn't require big heavyweight tools. So if you you know have existing sets of controls and you look at some of these lists like the CIS controls and think, oh gosh, I can't afford any of that, you may find that the data is there. You just have to get creative about the existing tools that you already have. That's an excellent tip, actually. And we've, by the way, had asset management companies as sponsors of this show. Mike, what's your top tip? Well, first of all, I really like what, what Bruce said there about getting the most out of your existing tools. That That's really kind of the, you've already got these investments. Make sure that you're getting everything you can out of them is a great place to start. But a, a few things that I would kind of add on to that is there's really a lot of opportunity to maybe think about your program in a different way. Uh, I was talking with a friend of mine who was telling me a story of a gosh, Fortune 100 company that is a household name that everyone would recognize, their entire in-house security team is all security architects. They've outsourced everything else. They're basically getting their bang for their buck by saying architecture is what matters the most for us, making sure everything works together, making sure all of these services and consultants and products and whatnot work together is the way that we get the most out of our money. And that's a that's a company that's spending tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars on security. They have a huge investment and they've rethought the way that they do security in such a way where a lot of what many of us would consider core, they've outsourced. So really like the the, the one key tip that I would have is be creative. Maybe it's making use of the existing systems that you have. Maybe it's thinking about what is your budget? What are your, what are your limits? What is the company appetite for maybe outsourcing some things and making sure that you're getting the most of those services that you're outsourcing because you're paying for them? That's kind of my take on it is you, you're going to have to get creative to really make do with less to get more out of it. But also listen to Bruce because he had a really good point there. Well, let me actually do an exercise with both of you guys. You're both CISOs. You're both leaders. You both want to get your team to be more creative. Talk to this audience right now as, as if you're trying to like go, okay, guys, what ideas you got? Where can we start looking to be more creative? Like, how do you go about doing that? And, and one of the things I always sort of like to say about brainstorming is, 
good ideas often come out of really bad ideas. And, you know, you've heard the sort of trite line of, oh, there are no bad ideas. But it's, I'm happy to have bad ideas because it causes people's brains to go in different directions. So that's when I'm always sort of in brainstorming sessions. I love to hear bad ideas personally. So what do you guys do, Bruce, to sort of get that sort of creative security juices going? So I think as a corollary to good ideas come from, you know, start with bad ideas. I think good ideas also come from bad situations. When you're under duress, when something crazy is going on in your organization, yes. oftentimes you can come up with creative solutions to things you couldn't, you couldn't have possibly dreamt up until it was a very bad day. So what we do is we do uh, tabletops every quarter where we pretend the bad things happen. And we drive through that situation and see how we would react as an organization. So obsessively, this is to you know test the IR process and things like that. But really what it does is allows us to explore parts of organizations as if they were really under attack or there was really some terrible situation going without it actually happening. And then we can sit around the table and brainstorm, okay, how would we deal with this? How would we try to make it better? And what we've actually developed uh, with the help of my son actually is a role-playing game, kind of D&D style, but it's focused on cyber incident response. So you make characters and you roll dice and that kind of thing. And so I found that the element of chance where there are parts of the incident that we leave up to the dice. And when you roll the dice and the dice don't cooperate, suddenly it's a really bad day and then they have to get very creative. And so we found that's a great way to explore parts of our organization, come up with new ideas, explore new avenues of how to protect our environment. That's worked really well for us. By the way, is this a game that people could actually purchase? It's a uh, free game. It's a Creative Commons. It's available. It's called Onos, O-N-O-E-S with an exclamation point. We presented it at DEF CON in 2018. Actually, my son did. I broke my foot 18 hours before DEF CON, so he flew out and did it. So, um, but yeah, it's like D&D, except it's for instant response. You make characters eat Cheetos. It's a great time. Ah, well, we will definitely link to it. Mike, what would you say to, you know, something you can tag on or add anything else to what Bruce just said? I liked what Bruce had to say, but I'll, I'll go in a slightly different direction and kind of harken back to the earlier mentions of NIST cybersecurity framework and the CIS top 20. I think it's a great exercise to kind of sit down with those existing frameworks and say, well, how would we implement those here? You know, how, what does asset management look like in our organization? What is patch management look like in our organization? I think there's a lot to be said for walking through those existing frameworks and figuring out how you would apply them to your organization. And that can really spark a lot of creativity that might come back to, you know what, we actually could look at our DHCP logs and pull that into a spreadsheet on some regular basis. And we kind of have asset management at that point. So I think there's there's really a lot of creativity that can come from trying to apply a framework to your existing environment. And now Steve Prentice with this week's cloud security tip brought to you by OpenVPN, provider of next gen secure and scalable communication software. OpenVPN Access Server keeps your company's data safe with end-to-end -end encryption, secure remote access, and extension for your centralized UTM. Study after study shows a top priority for cloud users is having visibility into application and data traffic. But most are not getting it. Nine out of ten respondents believe that access to packet data is needed for effective monitoring. So even though the cloud providers maintain the fortress, the enterprise still needs to see what's going on. Cloud needs its own approach to monitoring, more closely based on how cloud customers interact with their data. It needs its own tools and a greater level of communication between them and their providers. One of the most interesting facts to come from these studies is that 99% of respondents, yes, 99%, saw a direct link between comprehensive network visibility and business value, which means that IT and IT performance can be proven to contribute directly to the bottom line. Yes, we all knew that, but it's good to see it in print. The short-term benefit might actually be improved data visibility, but the longer-term benefit will be a larger and more authoritative voice from IT at the C-suite table. Why is everyone talking about this now? We have talked in the past about the tired and negative image of the hacker in the black hoodie. It's pretty much all you see in stock photos. And since that's all the media outlets use, 
the image just keeps getting reinforced. So poking fun, and I think also truly trying to find a better hacker image meme, Casey Ellis, founder of Bug Crowd, challenged others on LinkedIn to find a better hacker stock photo than the one he posted, which was of hands coming out of the screen and typing on your keyboard with a cat looking on. So I'll start with you, Mike. What is the truly worst hacker image you've seen? And maybe just what I just said. And could you propose a new stock image look for the hacker community? <laughs> I mean, there, there's so many of them out there. I mean, it's 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 become kind of a meme on top of a meme of like, you know, how do you find the the worst picture? Uh, the one that I that I come back to is it's uh, someone in a black hoodie. You know, you can't see their face because it's so dark. And they've got these really big, bulky leather gloves on, and they're typing on a laptop keyboard with the Matrix screensaver going on. And it's this combination of all of the tropes all in one picture. And that, so that one's my favorite. By the way, I want to tell you that I ran into Michael Farnham in D.C. at a HP hacker conference, and they had like a quote – well, it wasn't. It was a security conference – and but they had a quote hacker zone, and he was sitting in a station, literally dressed and looking <laughs> just like that. That is awesome. Yes. And by the way, like he had, they had like you know crushed Jolt Cola cans around. It was very funny. <laughs> I think a, a great contest at a conference at some point would be: here's a pair of leather gloves. Now go break into this thing over here. <laughs> but I, I, in terms of like better photos, I like you know Chris Roberts actually posted a picture of a squirrel on top of a keyboard and i thought that one was a good one because it's on the face of it kind of hilarious but if you think about it a little bit most people in the security industry and and outside of the industry who are not necessarily on the good side of things they're actually easily easily distracted so the the concept of hey there's a squirrel that that's a that's a good a good one uh, to to think about i what i would propose is Frankly, you know, a big room with a bunch of computers and a looking very much like a assembly line factory floor kind of thing, because that's what I really think about in terms of what most people in the industry and, and outside of the industry look like. All right. I will throw this to you, Bruce. You will have the closing. What's what's your your best sort of new hacker look you would like? Well, so I have to agree with Mike that the, the, the matrix trope actually is, I think, one of the worst parts of the hacker stock photo universe uh, because it kind of conveys that the typical, stereotypical, what hackers do is totally incomprehensible. I know people who are security professionals who still view hacking and breaking into things as dark magic, and it's really just structured thinking and understanding how systems work to be able to to kind of crack the code and, and find a way in. It's not it's not magic. It's just kind of a frame of, of thought. So the, the Matrix one just really gets me going. I think as far as how to reimagine that, honestly, most of the people that I know in this industry who are consider themselves hackers are largely self-taught. They got into this universe because they like it. They like to spend the time. They like the, the intellectual challenge. And in my mind, those are people who are kicking back on their couch on a weekend when their spare time, they're ripping apart something, uh, they're standing up stuff in AWS, they're playing with source code, they got their feet in the coffee table, dogs running around, kids pulling on their shirt sleeves, whatever it is, you know, but it, it is not an office with lights and cubicles. It's not a dark room with a, with a, a hoodie. It's literally people just being in their own environment in a comfortable place, thinking about how to make systems do things they're not supposed to do and then how to make them better. Right. And also one of the things that we've talked about this on the, the show before is that hacker sort of traditionally has only a negative implication in the, the general media. Uh, in the security community, they know that that hacker is it's a character type that often you want on your security team. But the general media has not sort of absorbed it as such in the way that you just described it. Bruce, it would be better to absorb that way, I think. I tend to agree. I, li I like it if we could see it as a positive thing and not a negative thing. Well, let's bring this whole darn thing to a close. Bruce, everything you delivered was awesome. You actually gave us some really, really hardcore advice all throughout the episode. So I can't thank you enough for that. And I want to also thank Expel for bringing you to us and uh, sponsoring this entire episode of the show. So thank you to Expel. Thank you to Bruce. Bruce, we'll let you also have the last word. And you can, by the way, 
plug Expel, please do. And also if you're hiring, let us know. But Mike, first, anything to say? Bruce, thank you for joining us. I, I, I really enjoyed the entire conversation, your creative way of thinking about things, but also bringing specific examples. I, I liked how you were talking about DHCP web logs, looking at the logs for your for your email server to understand who your your users are. Great, very specific tips. And also thank you for giving us a little bit of a behind the scenes of, of ShmooCon and helping us understand a little bit better what, what that's all about. So thank you for those specifically, but in general, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the creative conversation. I look forward to hearing more from you. And and I'm gonna make a proposal right here for a new hashtag, hashtag couch hacking. Oh, I like that. <laughs> All right, Bruce, you get the final word and please plug away anything uh, regarding Expel and let us know if you're hiring. First of all, I just want to uh, remind people of some of the tools that we talked about earlier, the NIST self-assessment tool and the Oh No's cyber incident response role-playing game that we make available on our website. We also have a third-party risk questionnaire and kind of associated material to stand up a third-party risk program. We only have 10 questions that we ask our vendors. We try to keep it very simple. We'll also be releasing a self-assessment tool around the new NIST privacy framework as well, hopefully in the next few weeks. So we release all these to the community, not because it's part of our business, but because we think it's the right thing to do. Rising tide raises all ships or whatever cliche you want to use, but please feel free to make use of the work that we've done to make your organization better. Also, as far as the company goes, we really think we've kind of reimagined the MSSP MDR market. We like to think we do a lot of good for our customers. We make it very easy to onboard. Usually in the day, we get you results and tell you specifically what's happening in your network and what you need to do about it. You don't just get alerts back from us. You actually get actionable reports to say, this is what's wrong and this is how you make it better. And I'll be honest, like uh, I love the company. I love what we've been able to do with our customers. I've never had a customer come up and hug me. We've had customers come up and say like, I get to see my kids' baseball games now because of you. <laughs> so, you know, we've been able to kind of transform the companies that have trusted us to help keep them secure. And my job as CISO is to make sure that we retain that trust and, and we run a high insurance organization that's worthy of the trust they placed in us. So if you're interested, expel.io, please check us out. I'd love to have you. All of that is excellent. And, and Bruce, you will provide the links to me so I can share them with our community on everything that you said at the beginning there. And thank you again. This was truly excellent. This was a great, great episode. To our audience, who are contributors, thank you. Do not stop. If you want me to not only read Eric Block What's Worst Scenarios, <laughs> send me more. He's got a lot of good ones, but send me better ones. I still have a lot of good ones, but I, I just like this Eric Block one. I thought it was great and also appropriate for, for our uh, guests today. Thank you for contributing and thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.